follow the order of service on page five in the front of the hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord.
Christ, thou almighty Son of God, who art no longer in humiliation here on earth, but sitteth at the right hand of thy Father, Lord over all things. We beseech thee, send us thy Holy Spirit. Give thy church pious preachers. Preserve thy word. Control and restrain the devil and all who would oppress us. Mightily uphold thy kingdom until all thine enemies have been put under thy feet that we may hold the victory over sin, death, and the devil. Through thee, who livest and reignest with God the Father and the Holy Ghost, one true God, world without end.
Micah, the fifth chapter, concerning spiritual gifts. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil, for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Here ends the epistle. Please stand to the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning with the 35th verse, the Lord of the Harvest.
peace be multiplied to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God chosen for our instruction and in righteousness on this occasion is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of our God. We pray. Dear Jesus, bless the preaching of your word and the hearing of it. Amen. In Genesis 32, verse 10, the patriarch Jacob said, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. In Mark chapter 1, verse 7, we read how John the Baptist preached, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. The Apostle Paul wrote, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And in the sacristy prayer, Martin Luther wrote and prayed, O Lord God, dear Father in heaven, I am indeed unworthy of the office and ministry in which I am to make known your glory and to nurture and to serve this congregation. And I see that there's a copy of the prayer right here. Exactly. Now as you listen to those comments I just shared with you, one thing stands out in common among them all. It is the shared feeling of unworthiness by believers. And it's a proper attitude to have. What worthiness do we sinners possibly have to hear a word of comfort from the God that we gravely sin against each and every day? What right do we wretched sinners have to expect that the holy God of heaven should stoop down to speak to us? Who are we that we should be able to hear with our own ears, read with our own eyes, and speak with our own tongues the holy and pure word of the holy and righteous God of heaven. We are indeed all unworthy. But a problem arises when we confuse our own unworthiness with that of being ill-equipped for ministry. This problem stems from losing faith's proper focus and perspective. That is to say, the reason we confuse our unworthiness with being ill-equipped is that we get too caught up in looking at ourselves. But God does not call and equip us for ministry on the basis of ourselves. Rather, our text points out that God equips his chosen vessels for ministry on the basis of his word. It is God himself who establishes the pastoral ministry, and he establishes and builds it upon the foundation of his holy word and sacraments, not on the basis of the sinner's wit or eloquence. As the hymnist states, the words which absolution give are his who died that we might live. The minister whom Christ has sent is but his humble instrument. So we can study, continue to study our text. May we be reminded that with God's word, we are thoroughly equipped to serve, and we are thoroughly equipped to be served. And when you look through Paul's letters to Timothy, it would seem as though Timothy certainly understood his own unworthiness as a sinner, and likely also struggled with his own feelings of being <laughs> ill-equipped. 
For example, in 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise your youth. Later in that same letter, Paul addresses what appears to be Timothy's weak stomach, telling him to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. Perhaps his weak stomach stemmed from Timothy's feelings of anxiety about his personal ministry. And finally, and most conclusively, in 2 Timothy 1.7, we read these words from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, the point in bringing all of this up is to illustrate that our text before us from 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 17 this text was not written in a vacuum. Rather, the backdrop was that of Paul writing to a young pastor who we might say was just starting out in his pastoral ministry, and who seemed to think that his own unworthiness as a sinner, along with his apparent timid spirit, left him ill-equipped to shepherd the flock of God, which the Holy Spirit had seen fit to put under his charge. Apostle Paul boldly points out to Timothy that that was simply not the case. In fact, in the chapter after our text, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul expressly reminds Timothy of what his pastoral duties were. Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will keep up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth, and turn aside a fable. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. The Apostle Paul clearly lays out before Timothy here all the duties that were to be expected of him as a pastor. Preaching the word, convincing, rebuking, exhorting, being watchful, enduring affliction, doing the work of an evangelist, fulfilling his ministry. Now as you look through that list of duties that pastors are charged to do, isn't it interesting to find in our text that God has given us the equipment needed to do all of those things? For our text says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, Paul says, is useful for doing the very thing pastors are called to do. In fact, in the original Greek, there are some words here that are the very same words used in the verses from chapter 4, highlighting and laying out the duties of the pastor. And so let's take a brief overview of our text and what sorts of things all scripture is useful for when it comes to the pastor's work. First, we're told that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, useful for doctrine. When we hear that word doctrine, we tend to immediately think of a specific formal creed or formula or confession. And while scripture is certainly useful for that, and those things are useful for our faith and confession, another way to translate this word is teaching. But it's simply all scripture is useful for teaching. Think of what Paul tells Timothy earlier in our text. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now there's some useful teaching, is it not? With all the holy scriptures, we cannot be made wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. Without God's special revelation of his word, we cannot know of the one who lived the perfect life for us, died on the cross for us, and rose again for our justification. And in fact, that's the most important teaching the scriptures provide for us. Everything else we learn from God's word revolves around this important point of Jesus Christ and him crucified for sinners. And so there is no part of scripture that we should think of as worthless 
But rather, all Scripture has been so breathed out by God that it may be a valuable teaching for us in the building up of our Christian faith. Next, we learn all Scripture is profitable, useful for reproof. Now, the word reproof isn't a word that we use very often anymore. One way of defining it is to put to the proof. One Greek dictionary explains the word as follows. It implies not merely the charge, but the truth of the charge, and further, the manifestation of the truth of the charge. And so you can think of this as a legal term. Some English translations even use the word convict here. Much like how a person is tried in a court of law, and the evidence is presented against him so thoroughly that he is convicted of a crime and pronounced guilty. <laughs> Scripture is useful for convicting all sinners of being sinners, of trying the case, wrongdoing, wrong thinking, wrong believing with such masterful evidence of the truth that the only possible outcome is a conviction and sentence of guilty as charged. All scripture is profitable, useful for correction. Here this word literally means a straightening up again. You can think of the conviction we talked about earlier of bringing a person down to his knees, humbling him, not merely showing him his sin, but proving it to him without a shadow of a doubt. Once this is done, the scriptures are then also useful for straightening us up again. Bringing us the good news of the gospel that the condemnation for the guilt of our sins is placed squarely in Jesus and his cross. And now his righteousness is credited to our work. First, we're taught what God expects of us in his word. We're then convicted in the court of God's law that we have failed to do those things. And then we're given the correction needed to straighten up again. Living and loving God's teaching because Jesus covers us with his holy precious blood. Finally, all scripture is profitable and useful for instruction in righteousness. Now here, the word of instruction, we have the very same word that is used in Ephesians 6 verse 4 where fathers are commanded to be involved in the Christian education of their children and they are told, to bring them up in the training, that's the same word there, training and admonition of the Lord. This word encompasses the whole of the child's training, especially including the cultivation of his mind and his morals, but it also includes the idea of discipline. And so you could think of this as a disciplined training in righteousness. In other words, it's not something that happens with the snap of your fingers. Rather, it takes work. It takes time, it takes chastening, it takes discipline. You think of the discipline training of the Olympic athlete. Many young children watch the Olympic athletes on the television. They think they can simply just grow up into that level of athleticism as they get older without much effort. They don't see the work, the effort, the chastening of the discipline training that goes on behind the scenes to form that Olympic athlete. A lifetime that's often what we Christians want as well. We want life's problems to simply vanish away with the snap of a finger without any effort on our part, that is to say, without opening our Bibles and using the Scriptures to our advantage in a disciplined training in righteousness. But Paul is explaining to Timothy, it's not how it works. If you go back and you look at the beginning of verse 14 of our text, you see, it begins with the word but. It's a conjunction. Paul was contrasting something with that word. Prior to our text, Paul writes this, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And then he continues, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured. He then points to the scriptures and all of the usefulness that they bring. This is the discipline, training, and righteousness of the Christian life that the Scriptures provide. 
as we continue in this. This is the work of the pastor. Encourage members to be in the word that they may remain disciples of the word. When we fail to continue in the Holy Scriptures, we're putting ourselves in danger of becoming those evil men and impostors, growing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But with God's useful word, Paul explains what the result is. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now because we may have a tendency sometimes to gloss over those words, I'm going to read that again and emphasize some important phrases. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. Let us realize what we're being told here. God's word is enough. With God's word, you are now complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work in your pastoral ministry. The reason we might fail to recognize this truth or gloss over it at times is because Satan in the world convinces us that God's word isn't enough. We've been conditioned to think that for our hardships and heartaches in life, what we really need are the answers from the secular world. Secular philosophy, secular psychology, secular counseling practices and methods, in short, man's wit and eloquence. They have so convinced us Christians that what the world uses to try and solve all of their problems are enough. That we now fail to see the all-encompassing usefulness of God's word. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. The success of the pastoral ministry hinges on the time, energy, and effort put into the study and meditation of God's Word because it is only the Word of God that brings any success to the pastoral ministry. And so, despite all of your unworthiness and weaknesses and failures, with Holy Scripture, you are thoroughly equipped to serve. So be strong in the Lord and in the power of His and with that same Holy Scripture, the members, the members of Calvary Lutheran Church are thoroughly equipped to be served. The person before you this day, divinely called by God Himself to be your new pastor. As you have heard enumerated from our text, all the duties your pastor has been charged by God to do on your behalf for your soul care, it's important to remember two things. First, this is not just the ministry of Pastor Paul again. This is the ministry of Calvary Lutheran Church. I draw your attention to the scripture lesson from 1 Thessalonians, where you read of a lot of the same directives that are given to the pastor. Now we exhort you. Here Paul's writing to a group of Christians, a congregation. Brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. It's also important to remember that your pastor is not some sinless heavenly being. He has not been called to be your pastor because he is any holier than you are. Rather, he is a sinner just like the rest of you. That your pastor is an unworthy sinner like you is no reason to disregard his pastoral care. If he comes to you with a word of pastoral concern, you do well to listen to him. As the one the Lord himself has called to watch over your soul. In that moment when he comes to you, he is being sent by the Lord of the church to bring a saving word of God to you. To listen to him for the strengthening of your faith. Ignore it at your own peril. 
I would direct you back to our Old Testament lesson where God told the prophet Ezekiel, When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning or speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. Very plainly here, God says to Ezekiel that if he does not warn the people of their sin and spiritual danger, that is on him. But if he does warn them, and they do not listen, that is on them. Likewise, if your pastor recognizes you are in spiritual danger, but does not warn you, that is on him. If he warns you and you do not listen, that is on you. Again, as a fellow sinner, your pastor has his own weaknesses, his own struggles with sin, just like all of you. There will be times when he will make mistakes in his ministry, but thankfully, you all have the great joy and privilege of going to the same wall of forgiveness provided for you by Jesus' blood and righteousness. Covers over the sins of both pastor and parishioner alike. The ministry of Calvary Lutheran Church then is well equipped because it is founded on the message of Christ crucified for sin. And so the pastor and parishioner alike, I re-echo the words of our text, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That is the end goal of it all, isn't it? That we might be made wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He has given us his word for that very purpose. He gives us each other to help one another from straying into the deceitful lies of the devil, the empty philosophies of this world. He gives us pastors to help shepherd us in the green pastures and still waters of the pure word of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God so that the pastor may serve and the parishioner may be served to the saving of souls and the glory of God's name. So the inspired word of God in your heads and hearts preached from this pulpit Read in your homes, you are truly complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All praise and thanks to God. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. Now may this peace of God that surpasses all understanding of our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
Adrian McGuire is invited to come offer their selection, we continue with him 491. <laughs>
Dear brother in Christ, Christ Jesus, the shepherd of our souls, has called you to be the under-shepherd, the pastor of this congregation. You are about to assume charge of the flock of Christ in this place. Please bear in mind the serious duties of your sacred office, that you may fulfill them in such a manner as is fitting of a sincere and faithful minister of Christ. As an ambassador for Christ, you are to preach and teach the word of God in all purity, to administer the holy sacraments according to the institution and ordinance of Christ, to instruct the young in the way of salvation, to counsel the erring, to strengthen the weak, to seek the lost, to comfort the sorrowing, and to care for the needy, to visit the sick, to, to minister to the dying, and to always have a heart and pray for the spiritual welfare of every soul under your care. You are to give yourself to the meditation and study of the scriptures, to administer your, administer your office in agreement with the word of God, and to show yourself and your family a pattern to others in devotion and godliness, giving no offense in any matter, so that the Savior not be ashamed. So says the Apostle Paul. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the, the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop, that bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Paul also said to young Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in it. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. I ask you, therefore, brother, in the presence of God and this congregation, are you willing and ready to take up the charge of this congregation and to perform faithfully all the duties of your ministry? If so, then answer, I am. I am. Will you preach and teach the word of God in truth and in agreement with the Holy Scriptures and the confessions of the Church of the Lutheran Confession and adorn the teaching of your Savior with a godly life? An answer, yes, with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. Dear members of Calvary Lutheran Church, my Christian friends, you've heard the serious promise of Pastor Paul again. I urge you to receive him with joy as your pastor, and always be mindful of what the Word of God asks of you as members of the flock. Attend with all diligence the preaching of the word, receiving it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Listen to all admonition from God's word, receiving with meekness the word which is able to save your soul. Help and support him, that he may instruct the young, remembering also that you fathers are to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Honor and love him as a gift from God, for the Spirit of God says, Respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. 
hold them in the highest, highest regard and love because of their work. Pray for him without ceasing that his labors and anxieties may be chased away and he may retain a cheerful spirit and his ministry among you may be blessed abundantly. Support his earthly need. For the Lord says the laborer is worthy of his height. St. Paul says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. <clears throat> Finally, remember the words of the apostle. Obey those that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account that they may do with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. I therefore ask you, members of Calvary Lutheran Church, are you willing to receive your pastor as a servant of God and to show him such love, honor, and proper obedience in the Lord as his due, an overseer and guide placed over you by the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd and bishop of souls, if so, then answer, we are. We are. Dear brother, on the ground of your call, I now install you as pastor of Calvary Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, charging you to be diligent and faithful in the performance of your duties as you shall give an account of it on the day of Christ's appearing. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I ask at this time that the brothers would come forward who have words of encouragement from the scriptures to speak to the Master Paul again. Words from Paul about what to remember 
We want to remind your people of it. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The same is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things. Brother Paul, there are countless encouragements from the scriptures that we can lay on the hearts of one another at such a time as this. I want to thank Pastor Greve for conceding to me the use of the Bible passage I had in mind initially for this occasion, and he did too. 1 Timothy 4, 16, reading in context says, Pastor Sebeth just reminded us, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, but the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. And then the words, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Brother Denton and the rest, as I mentioned in the uh, fellowship meal in connection with that, Pastor Waldemar Schutze used that 1 Timothy 4, 16 verse, the word to lay on his son's heart 60 years ago when I was in school as pastor in uh, one of our congregations. So those words were written 2,000 years ago. I want to lay on your heart and that of everyone that in these days of the church of the digital age, the internet and all, there's never been any words more important than that we pay attention to the words of the scriptures as my stepfather told me 60 years ago next to his own soul no more precious gift has been given unto a minister than doctrine this is the pure word of god the fountain of all faith the seed of god's children the bread of life the source of all godliness therefore he says we must have and preserve the doctrine as the chief thing in our holy office. Yes, have it and preserve it. Brother Denton, I uh, conclude by reiterating that other portion of Paul to Timothy, till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. God's richest blessings as you minister to the Savior's lambs and sheep here in the Marquette area. The Lord would have us know, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Remember those words, share those words, cherish what God has given you to serve in this congregation. I also, on behalf of the congregation that has nurtured you and your family and has help to send you into ministry, leave you with these words, Jesus, teach. Amen. Brother Paul, I leave you with these words, the great Psalm 119, the song that teaches us the joy and the strength and the comfort that we have in God's word. I'll not share the whole song with you. <laughs> Only these verses. My soul clings to the dust. 
Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So shall I meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. May the Lord bless your ministry here among God's lambs. Calvary Lutheran, Mark. Go then, brother, and feed the flock of Christ that is placed under your care, doing so not because you must, but willingly, not for money, but of a ready mind, not as a lord over God's people, but an example to his flock. When the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. The Lord bless you from on high, make you a blessing to many, that you may bring forth fruit, that your fruit may remain to eternal life. O Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal and only Son of God, who sits at the right hand of the Father and gives gifts to men, sending forth pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry and the building up of your spiritual body, the church. We thank and praise you that you have again provided this flock with a faithful shepherd. And we pray, grant to both pastor and people your heavenly grace, so that they may do what is pleasing in your sight, holding onto faith and a good conscience, and finally with all the elect, obtain everlasting life. Amen. Please rise. Join me in a prayer of praying, thanksgiving, and supplication to the Lord. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nation. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a song, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world, and the peoples with equity. O Lord our God, we acknowledge your great goodness toward us, and praise you for the mercy and grace that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have known. We sincerely repent of the sins of this day and those of the past. Pardon our offenses. Correct and reform what is lacking in us, and help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Inscribe your law upon our hearts, and equip us to serve you with holy and blameless lives. May each day remind us of the coming of the night when no one can wait. In the emptiness of this present age, keep us united by a living faith through the power of your Holy Spirit with him who is the resurrection and the life that we may escape the eternal bitter pains of condemnation. 
By your Holy Spirit, bless the preaching of your word, which has been spoken to us today. And by your Holy Spirit, increase our saving knowledge of you. Bless the administration of your sacraments, and we pray you preserve these gifts to us and to all Christians, that day by day we may be strengthened in the divine truth and remain steadfast in your grace. Guard and protect us from all dangers to body and soul. Grant that we may, with faithful perseverance, receive from you our sorrows as well as our joys, knowing that health and sickness, riches and poverty, and all things come by permission of your bodily hand. Keep us to stay under your protection and care and preserve us, especially those who have traveled great distances to be here today. Be with them and return them safely to their homes, securely trusting in your everlasting goodness and love. We humbly implore, implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. We ask all of this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue then, and let's stay, stay risen, I guess, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Hymn number 50. Now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
Well, first I have to make a confession that I've been coveting. I see this crowd out here. And I <laughs> okay. Uh, I have some letters of greeting and um, welcome, and well, we'll just read them and see what they're about. Um, the first one is from uh, Pastor Michael Wilkie, also the president of the uh, of our church body, the CLC, Church of the Lutheran Confession. Dear brothers and sisters of Calvary Lutheran Church, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am so thankful that the Lord has answered your prayers by providing you with a new shepherd. I am confident that Pastor Agenton and his family will be a real blessing to your congregation. I'm also confident that you will support and encourage him and his family in every way possible. I had the privilege of reading the sermon you just heard from Pastor Stephen. What a wonderful reminder that the Bible is God's inspired word. In this godless world, it is the one source of absolute and timeless truth incomparably profitable for us sinners in so many ways. What a tremendous comfort to know that God's Word reveals to us a crucified Savior by whose blood all our sins are washed away. You can be sure that Pastor Agenton will proclaim to you and shepherd you with nothing more and nothing less than the Word of God while always endeavoring to point you to Jesus and his salvation, he won for us all. May the Lord richly bless your partnership in the gospel. May you grow together in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 Yours in Christ, Pastor Michael Wilkie. And this from St. John's uh, Lutheran Church and School of Wokabina, Minnesota. Dear members of Calvary and Pastor Elect again. So it's already on. <laughs> uh, we rejoice with you on this special occasion as Pastor Agenton is installed as your shepherd. And you begin the work that the Lord has called you to do. The Holy Spirit has a, once again blessed his flock with the gifts that are needed for the gospel ministry, as he makes clear in the fourth chapter uh, of, of Ephesians. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. May the Lord who has blessed, who has matched the special gifts of Pastor Agenton with the unique opportunities of Calvary Lutheran Church richly bless his work in your, in your midst. In Christ, members and pastor, St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church and School. And finally, this from uh, Nathan Pfeiffer, pastor of Berea Evangelical Lutheran Church in River Grove Heights. Dear brother and sisters of, in Christ at Calvary and St. Peter's, and especially on this day, you, Pastor Jackson and Courtney. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, who ascended on high and gave gifts to men, including the gift of pastors, grace and peace be with you all. On this occasion of your ordination and installation, we give thanks to the Lord of the church, who has prepared, equipped, and provided you to his church for the care of the people. What the Apostle Paul says of the pastoral ministry has proven itself true for the last 2,000 years. This is a faithful saying. 
If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The pastoral ministry certainly is work. It is work to diligently study God's holy word, prayerfully seeking to divide it correctly. It is work to go after the straying and the lost, to care for, the, for those who mourn, to comfort the repentant sinner, and to carry out Christ's commission to teach every each to teach each everything which he has commanded us. While it is a work, it is also a good work. It is good because of Jesus Christ. He has done the hard work of redeeming lost sinners by his death on the cross. He has done the work of overcoming death to give hope to those living in the valley of the shadow of death. He has given us that good news to share. In the water and word of holy baptism, we get to share the good news with the infant and the aged. To the communicant, we have the honor of feeding them with the body and blood of their Lord in holy communion. Truly, the pastoral ministry is work but it is a good work. We wish we could be there in person to give thanks to the Lord with you today. While we cannot, we give thanks that the Lord has promised to be with you on this great day and in the days to come. May you go forth in the name of the Lord, confident of his promise to us through the Apostle Paul. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. May he be with you as you carry out this good work at Calvary and at St. Peter's and with all you come into contact with. Your fellow servant in Christ, Nathan Pfeiffer, Pastor Maria uh, Lutheran Church. Here ends our uh, uh, letters, our communications. Thank you.